housekeeping notes, uh, especially with regard to recent uh, Zoom attacks that have happened in our world. Uh, so you no doubt noticed that for security reasons, we have kept your videos off. We have muted everyone but the speakers and we've disabled the chat. When our discussion opens up for Q&A, the chat will be available for your questions and comments. And although initially we thought uh, we would offer the opportunity for folks to ask their questions live, we decided with so many of you here, which is fantastic, um, that it was best to keep questions in writing and in the chat. So again, my many thanks for joining us and I will turn it over to my colleague, Jeff Thorne. Hi, everybody. Uh, I think you can hear me. Um, let's, let's call it what it is. This was Sally's idea. Uh, I helped bring it to, to light, but this is her idea, so I'm really happy to play a part in it, but uh, this is her brainchild. Uh, it is my happy task to introduce Alyssa Goldstein Seppenwald, who is a professor of history at California State University at San Marcos. At San Marcos, she has won the Harry E. Brakebill Outstanding Professor Award in 2014-2015, as well as the President's Award for Innovation in 2004-05. Many of us know Alyssa from her numerous plenary speeches, conference papers, her warm presence at meetings of the French Colonial Historical Association, Asian Studies Association, Society for French Historical Studies, the Western Jewish Studies Association, Western Society for French History, and the World History Association. She is very busy professional. But one of the reasons we wanted her here today is, is her work as a scholar. She is the author of a vast number of articles, of book reviews, of teaching publications aimed at both French world historians, and she has done a great deal of public facing. We also know her well for her three books, The Abbe Grégoire and the French Revolution, The Making of Modern Universalism, very relevant to today's topic, which appeared with the University of California Press in 2005. It also had a French translation that came out in 2008 with a new introduction. She then edited Haitian History, New Perspectives, which came out with Routledge in 2013, which has been a wonderful help to scholars and students, has an honored place on my shelf. Her newest work is Slave Revolt on Screen, The Haitian Revolution in Film and Video Games, which will be coming out with the University Press of Mississippi in June, this June, and she will be delivering her very own French press uh, in July, so please keep an eye out for that, um, as well as for all of the wonderful scholars who are going to participate in the series between. So we are very grateful for Alyssa's help in organizing today's session and ensuring that we minimize any possible threat of outside interference, but please join me in welcoming her as our inaugural discussion. As our inaugural discussion. Alyssa, take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Professor Horn, uh, Jeff. I, that was really very, very lovely. I thank you very much. And I feel compelled to add, I guess, that Professor Horn, when he was a graduate student, was my TA one semester, and I got an A minus. So I'm delighted to see that I have grown in this esteem since then. I'm, thank you so much, Jeff. It's really um, a privilege to be able to introduce. And Jeff, you're still pinned on my screen, if we can just fix that. Sally, you have to do that. All right. Sally, can you pin me so that I'm not looking at Jeff? All right. Excellent. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate your coming today. Thank you so much to Professors Horn and Charno for inviting me to participate. It's really an honor to introduce Professor Stovall. Professor Stovall is a professor of history and dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Fordham University. He is a past president of the Western Society for French History, and more importantly, a past president of the American Historical Association. Before being recruited to Fordham, Professor Stovall spent much of his career at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the University of California, Berkeley, 
both as a professor of history and as a dean. He is as loved as an administrator as a scholar. His books include Transnational France, The Modern History of a Universal Nation, Paris Noir, African Americans in the City of Light, The Rise of the Paris Red Belt, and his foundational essay collections, Black France with Tricka Keaton and T. Deneen Sharply Whiting, and The Color of Liberty, Histories of Race in France, which he edited with Sue Peabody. Professor Stovall has been a key figure not only in French and French colonial history, but also in helping create the field of Black European history and marshalling his resources to connect scholars from several continents who work in these fields. Uh, I've known Professor Stovall for many years. Um, with Walter Hawthorne, I don't know if he remembers this, but Tyler at Stanford when uh, we were graduate students in 1997, when we needed training in how to teach world history, which none of our professors taught. Um, he was also the very first guest speaker I hosted at my young university, Cal State San Marcos, back in 2000, when he spoke in one of the largest rooms we had, which was not very big, um, on race and immigration in France and beyond, politics, culture, and music. Um, so I've known Tyler and his work for a long time, but I have to say that I particularly love this new book, White Freedom, the Racial History of an Idea, and I can't wait for you all to read it. So Professor Stovall is going to speak um, for 10 to 12, or 15 minutes um, about the book, then I will ask a few questions and then we will open this to you to pose questions. In the thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alyssa. Can, can everybody hear me? Okay. Thank you, Alyssa, for that wonderful welcome. I remember those talks at Cal State San Marcos and I remember the talk at Stanford as well. Uh, thank you, Jeff and Sally for organizing this, and thank you to the Society for French Historical Studies for mounting this exciting new series. It is a great pleasure to come to talk to you today, and I'm very grateful for you taking the time on a Sunday afternoon to listen to me talk a bit about my book. So let me just dive right in. Uh, for those of you who have had a chance to see it, uh, you will note that the, the, this book actually starts with a discussion of the American Capitol building, the US Capitol building and the fact that it was in part at least built by slave labor. And I use this introduction to explore the, the sort of paradox that a building that has often been seen as the temple of liberty, a building that is really symbolizing America's commitment to liberty was built by those who were uh, not free. More specifically, I open the book with a discussion of what I see as a, an interesting uh, consideration. Uh, when it was discovered that this building was partly built by slave labor, the, the U.S. Congress decided to have a ceremony. They decided to dedicate part of the building, Emancipation Hall, in honor of the, de of the, the slaves who had helped build it. And they had a major, and it was interesting, bipartisan ceremony in the first decade of the 21st century to, to inaugurate this and to commemorate the memory of these slaves. And so I raised the question. This was a wonderful ceremony in many ways, underscored by its bipartisan nature. But it also begged the question, why would you call a building that was built by slave labor Emancipation Hall? Because after all, the slaves who helped build it were not emancipated. And the idea of emancipation did not express their daily reality, even if it did you know, affirm their hopes for life. Um, and I also raised the question, why not call it Slave Hall? If you wanted to be accurate, if you wanted to really uh, remember the, the, the lives of the people who helped build it, and why would it be impossible to use that name? So um, that is how I started the book. And then, of course, a couple weeks ago, when the US Capitol building was invaded by a mostly white mob, I, like most of you, probably reacted at first with shock and horror. But it also brought back to me two points. First of all, it brought back to me the idea that this whole history of race in the US Capitol building had a long, long history, going back to construction in the early 19th century. Secondly, part of a gut reaction was that well, here you have a largely white mob raiding the Capitol building, threatening to overthrow the U.S. government. Most of them were allowed to simply walk away free. And so if that doesn't show that freedom still has a, a racial characteristic, that, that freedom is still not white in America, I don't know what would. So um, I had that sort of gut reaction as well. 
This was a book that came about partly because the idea simply wouldn't leave me alone. Um, I thought about it over and over again, and in particular, I thought about the idea that the relationship between freedom and race has often been portrayed as a contradiction. In societies like France and like the United States, people have noted that you, these are societies that emphasize freedom as their highest value, that uh, emphasize freedom as a part of their national identity, and yet have often been party to major racist practices. And that has usually been posed as a contradiction. I'm not really comfortable ultimate with the, ultimately with the idea of contradiction, because it seems to me that if you have two things that coexist, there must be a reason for their coexistence. There must be something they have in common that permits them to endure in the same space for, in this case, centuries. So I decided that the, the, the thing that was dot, 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 thing that was bringing them together was the idea that freedom was racial, that freedom was not general, but it was in effect white freedom. It was freedom for whites, or to put it another way, to be free is to be white, and to be white is to be free. And so that was the idea I decided to explore in this book, and I've done so over two centuries, focusing on the United States and on France. Now, let me say a, a couple words about what it means to do this kind of history as a transnational history, in effect. Um, this is, this is a, an approach to history I've been very much invested in quite some time. And I think it does yield all sorts of valuable insights to the histories of nations. I think all nations exist on a transnational plane and exploring the relationships between national cultures and local cultures and global systems is, is very interesting. In this case, I found that France and the United States had a lot to offer in terms of making this kind of comparison. Both are countries that really emphasize the idea that liberty is at the heart of their uh, existence nation. And in both uh, cases, push for liberty has shaped much of their foreign and colonial imperial policy. So in other words, they are expanding overseas as a, as a means of bringing liberty to other peoples throughout the world. At the same time, however, I found that ultimately dealing with a topic like this, it was not enough to compare just France and the United States. The experience of those two countries is, lies at the heart of the book but it is not the totality of the book. I found, for example, you could not really do this subject justice without looking at the British Empire, for example, with looking at, without looking at the relationship between the British home islands and the empire that it carved out in the 18th and 19th centuries. I also found that one could not really understand how this, this uh, uh, idea worked out fully without looking at the history of Nazi Germany and fascism in interwar Europe that Nazism in particular had its own version, vision of the racial state, which was uh, not completely isolated from racism in other parts of the world. And looking at that relationship uh, was an important part of the story of, of race and freedom. And then of course, uh, looking at imperial or colonized nation, colonized territories and uh, their fate, uh, future as nation was an important part of this history. So this became a world history in many ways, but a world history that still focuses on France and the United States. Now, having said that, very conscious of the fact that I'm speaking to a group of French historians, as am I, and yet much of the, the attention that this book has received so far, at least in the American press, of course, has focused on the American side. So I'm very interested in seeing what people have to say about the French dimension of this study or the French dimensions of this idea. It seems to me, uh, looking at the history of France through the lens of this debate over freedom and race, there's a few periods that stand out. One is the Enlightenment, Enlightenment for example. Because the Enlightenment was a global movement, but in many ways its heart was in France. And many of the ideas and contradictions that surface in this study uh, appear in France itself, especially in the relationship between France and Saint-Domingue and the slave rising in Saint-Domingue, which gave rise to modern Haiti. There's also the issue of the republic and citizenship. How does the idea of, of citizenship have a racial dimension? How is it racialized? Um, and that brings in a third aspect, which is that of the empire. One of the things that attracted me to this study was a classic paradox that looking at the rise of modern European empires in the 19th and 20th century, the empires that were the, the biggest and most powerful were those run by democratic states. This was true of Britain, and it was especially true of France. I was very fascinated with the idea of the Third Republic as being an empire without an emperor. 
for example, a republic that overthrew an empire, the second empire, the last uh, European empire in French history, only to establish the greatest empire that France uh, as a nation had ever known under the aegis of Republican. And that was one of the big sort of contradictions that I tried to explore and tried to show the ways in which it was not a contradiction at all, but revolved around racial differentiation and, and race, the relationship of race. So, th so those are some of the, the issues that I've looked at in terms of French history. But I want to emphasize again that French history has to be understood with a transnational focus. And I think the comparisons with the United States bring a lot to the story and I hope uh, in, have enriched the book. So those are some of the questions that I've looked at. Um, I'm sure there are many other things I can think of that never made it into the book. I'm sure that any of you, all of you who've written books have, have, have had the experience of like a day after the book appears in print or even before you think, oh my God, I should have talked about this or talked about that. That's why these kinds of talks are very useful for me because I see this work as really the beginning of the whole process of exploring some very fundamental relationships, uh, ideological relationships in the modern era. And I'm very excited to hear Alyssa's comments and to hear your questions. So thank you very much again for taking the time to, to uh, listen to this talk and uh, to consider uh, the book. Take care. Thank you so much, Tyler. That was really wonderful. Okay, you have already talked about a few of the things I was gonna ask about, but I, I think I, because I've read the book already and not everyone has, I'd love to get you to talk a little more about some of the things. So you're looking at the relationship between these two seminal concepts in the modern world, freedom and race. And uh, just a quote that I really loved. Models of autonomy and self-empowerment have often come with a racial dimension, as reflected in the popular saying, free white and 21. To be free is to be white and to be white is to be free. In this reading, therefore, freedom and race are not just enemies, but also allies. They are enemy whose histories cannot be understood separately. But baldly, at its most extreme, freedom can be and historically has been a racist ideology. So certainly, as you said, in terms of the, um, the contradictions in Republican citizenship, this suggests that this tension was there at the very beginning. Um, and I, both in France and the US, and I wondered if you might just talk a little more about it. Sure, uh, thank you for that. And yeah, this was in many ways the heart of the idea that got me going and that you know, had me spinning through several hundred pages trying to explore its, its ramifications. Um, one of the things I say is that I understand this is a rather controversial statement to say that freedom is racist, right? And, and I consider two sort of responses to that, which I think are, Many of people share, for example, and I think are important to consider. First of all, the idea is how can you call something that is inspired in many ways the best humanity a racist idea? Or how can you call it a negative idea? And one of my responses to that is that freedom has not always been considered positive. If you look at certain synonyms uh, for freedom, like license, for example, or liberty, um, those are negative images of freedom. The whole history of anarchism as a term, for example, is another example. There is this whole sense that freedom has to have boundaries. It has to have limits in order to be effective. And what I'm arguing is that one of those kinds of limits is in effect racial. The, the book opens with a chapter called Savage Freedom, which I look, in which I look at uh, two different types of freedom that are seen as ultimately free, uh, freedoms that have to be limited or destroyed. And people may take sort of, I find somewhat humorous the two examples I choose because, because one is piracy and the other is childhood. So this is the Peter Pan chapter. Well, in fact, I open it with a discussion of Peter Pan because in both cases, freedom, both groups represent freedom. In the case of pirates, freedom has to be, has to be overcome by the state. And it's interesting that the, the, in the history of Car Caribbean piracy, for example, it is declining in the early 18th century right at the same time as the transatlantic slave trade is really picking up and gathering steam. But also in terms of childhood, Children are beautiful, but the, the old notion of uh, childhood autonomy, children have to be controlled in the modern world and have to be turned into adults and give up their freedom in order to become truly free. Or as John Stuart Mill said, freedom is a matter of the mature race. And that, of course, is, leads into the whole idea of the ways in which non-whites are infantile, right? Or as Kipling put it, half devil and half child. Um, so that kind of, that represents the kind of you know destruction of freedom. The other 
aspect, the, the other objection I anticipated is the objection that says, well, what about all those struggles of peoples of color that have emphasized freedom? If you look at the historiography of the civil rights movement, for example, half the books on it have the word freedom in the title, uh, starting with John Hope Franklin's Slavery to Freedom, the classic. Um, and my response, and that's an interesting objection. In fact, at one point I was asked, given the, the problematic nature of the term freedom, should we look, look for something else? Should we choose another term? And my response was after some thought, basically, no, I don't think we should because so many people have fought for a universal vision of freedom. And I don't think we can take that away from history. And I think we have to build on it instead. So I hope that it helps answer your question. It, it does. And I, I, again, I know there might be people who have a problem with thinking about freedom as racialized, but I find your argument very convincing. Certainly, um, when we talk about Haiti and Haitian revolutionaries and how they're often depicted, we glorify white revolutionaries, even if they're mm -hmm. on their way to fulfilling their ideals, but the Haitian revolutionaries were, are often demonized for having mm -hmm. used violence um, to get their freedom. Um, they're I, I just wanted to throw out also um, in terms of what happened on the 6th, because I started to read your book before um, on the 4th, and then I came back to it on the 11th, and it really resonated. Um, so your argument that some whites see freedom as um, innate to them and inimical to blacks really struck home when I saw the footage of the man who ar uh, arrested the airport who yelled, at the police that he was being treated like a black man, or the woman who said, um, this is not America, they're shooting at us, they're supposed to shoot BLM, but they're shooting the Patriots. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they prove um, what it is you're arguing. They illustrated so many of the claims that you made. But I have a slightly different question now, which is um, early in your career, worked on topics that were more traditional. Mm -hmm. uh, you to be, to prove yourself as a French historian, you didn't necessarily also work on Black France. Mm -hmm. um, so what is it about this time that persuaded you to say, okay, I'm ready to take on um, this kind of book? Okay, well. Maybe that's, this... maybe that's a question that you can't answer in five minutes and you can tell me another time, but. <laughs> but let me just start off by saying having tenure is wonderful, right? Um, and I hope in my case, it's been a liberating thing. I, you know, I started working on Paris Noir after I got tenure. Um, but it's also, I think it's, it's much more complex than that. I mean, you know, when in my graduate school days long ago, I was in a very different kind of uh, intellectual setting, one that really emphasized class and uh, left politics and those kinds of issues. And that's how I ended up writing a book on the Paris suburbs. Now, one of the, the ironies of that choice was that you know, I started writing in the Paris suburbs in the early 80s with, first of all, hardly any historians had even heard of the area. Um, but also that, you know, it was famous for its, its political um, sort of leanings, but not so much for what it was evolving to, which is sort of the symbol of post-colonial France, right? And people working on the area now today, I mean, it's, it's the, the heartland of French hip hop, for example, it's the heartland of all sorts of different kinds of racial politics as well as just being a very different area. So in some ways, you know, I was sort of choosing an area that little beknownst to me when I was a graduate student would really emphasize these kinds of issues as it has ever since, right? So, you know, part of it was dumb luck, but I think partly, and also finally, I think that, you know, as it's now I can claim to be a senior scholar in the field, I think I have a, a, a responsibility to look beyond sort of my dissertation research, to look beyond the ways in which I was trained, to explore new ways of looking at things. Um, and they may work or they may not. But, you know, this is where I come back to the tenure piece. At least I've still got a job even though I'm like the book, so. <laughs> right, so what I'm gonna do is I have one more question, but in the meanwhile, I am going to just give me a moment, uh, make sure we get this all going technically. Actually, maybe Sally or Jeff, um, if you could open the chat so it goes only to us, we can start to collect some questions now. And I will just ask you um, one more. I was going to ask you how teaching world history shaped this, but you already talked a little bit about that. So can you just talk about some of the changes that you see over the long durée? Because your book fans, I, I love the scale of the book, um, but you're going over this um, 
big amount of time. Good. So the chat might be on now. Yeah. What are some of the changes that you see over the long term? Okay. Well, first of all, this sort of follows up from your earlier question. Um, it's sort of scary for a historian like me to try and tackle two centuries of history because I'm dealing with lots of topics, subtopics that each have a very sort of intense and fraught historiography on their own. To give one example, there's the whole question during the American Revolution, did the, the, the American patriots uh, mount their separation from Britain for the goal of, of, of preserving slavery in the American colonies, which is, as you know, has uh, probably know has caused a huge fraught uh, uh, discussions leading to, uh, what was it, last week's 1776 report published by the, <laughs> the Trump administration, which, by the way, has now been taken off the White House. But, but um, even at that level, so, you know, you come to an, uh, a field as, as a sort of interested um, observer, but not as a true specialist in kind of way that somebody has done intense archival research for decades. Area. So there's liabilities with that. I think there's also assets. I think I bring a new perspective. I think more generally, um, in terms of how our field has changed, certainly the rise of colonial and transnational perspectives has been something that hardly existed at all when I was a graduate. Um, and has taken some time to develop and has really started to, I don't want to say call into question, but reshape what we mean by French history and what we mean by France uh, and other countries as well. And I think these are all wonderful developments in a world that is increasingly globalized. I mean, for example, I'm very interested, partly as the father of a teenager, your work on video games, right? Uh, but if you look at video games, they're the biggest selling cultural products in the world now. And they're going to be shaping not only our present, but how we view history as well. So, um, yeah, the field has changed uh, enormously, and I think that's very exciting. Great. I have two great questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to start with one from Jean Beeman, um, who says, thanks to you for this rich discussion. As a Black scholar, I would love to hear more about the influence um, of Professor Soval's own identity in doing this work and broader research and scholarly trajectory. So expanding a little more on what I asked. As we know, that discussing race and racism in the French context brings charges of importing Anglo-American <laughs> concepts. I would be curious to hear how you have met. Um, with great delicacy, let me just respond to that. Because I mean, I can remember, for example, at one point being at a um, panel with a black French scholar who was very much into this idea that this represented a kind of American imposition or African-American imposition, if you will. So um, let me answer your broader question in two respects. First of all, in terms of my own identity as an African-American, I feel it has uh, shaped uh, my willingness to engage in questions of race and shape the ways in which people who read my work react uh, to my work and react to me. It has given me the ability to, to for example, reach out to uh, communities of African-American scholars working in a different field. Um, I've also had to negotiate oftentimes the expectation or the rather surprise that an African-American would be specializing in French history instead of American or African-American history. And I've tried to turn that to my advantage to say that I have something to, to bring to this topic. Um, and then in terms of negotiating this whole issue of histories of race, studies of race in France, I remember an anecdote that happened right at the time of um, the 2005 suburban riots in France. There was an American journalist who was actually assigned to a police detachment in one of the hardest, hottest hit um, areas of the Paris suburbs. And at one point he asked the police captain, so uh, why are there no uh, policemen of color in your unit? And the response of the captain was, this is France. We, we, don't, we don't ask those kinds of questions. We are all citizens of the Republic. We do not think in terms of race at all. Um, and he just sort of threw up his hands at this response. But it, it forms a something that you have to negotiate with that you have to deal with and at times you have to say okay without saying you know you're wrong just say that this is my perspective coming from my own background and i'm interested in exploring the ways in which these issues play out and it's also important to point out that there are voices in france that also say that that race has to be taken into account and how those voices are treated so um i try not to be an american imperialist and of course for all of us in french history who are not french there's always this danger that we're seen as bringing something american to the study of the subject. In some ways, it's a good thing. In some ways, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging, it's very different. But I don't uh, shrink from saying that I'm going to bring a different perspective based on my own life and based on who I am. 
Okay, I've got so many questions. I'm managing them. So let me go now um, to one from Jonathan Judakin, um, who wants to come back to the long duffe. Can you expand the discussion of the long duffe? What do you see as the influence, this is a big one, of Christianity <laughs> in shaping the racialized discourse of freedom vis-a-vis -vis Jews and Muslims in particular? Mm -hmm. Of Christianity. Okay. Okay. Well, in some ways, you can go really long back. Uh, all the way to the days of Clovis and the creation of uh, France as a unified entity um, and saying that it was, it was a Christianized entity. So um, I think this is something that is very much a topical issue, but it also has a long-term sort of history to it. But let, let's go to the sort of most topical nature of it. I mean, if you look at the relationship of, say, Muslims in contemporary France to the French state, there is this incredible tension around how French identity has to have a certain characteristic that Muslims are not a part of, right? That are ex Muslims are excluded from this identity. And part of it has to do with the idea of freedom. That uh, part of the, the idea of freedom, I think, in France is declined by the history of uh, secularism and the rise of the, the movement against the, 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 the religious state, right? Uh, in many ways, religious communities that are not part of the Catholic community are excluded from that history and therefore excluded from uh, that belonging that. I think if you look at uh, the history of Jews in France, for example, one of the things I've written on recently is the, the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which is uh, something that really exemplifies an attempt to sort of bring together Jewish traditions and French traditions to create a Jewish French universalism, if you will. And it's interesting to look at how that was received because it mostly it was mostly French Jews working in North Africa. And the reception of that, their, their ideas creating a French Jewish culture in North Africa was challenging, let's put it this way, um, and not always well received by the Jewish communities in North Africa and Turkey. So, uh, but it also does represent an attempt to sort of marshal this idea of French universalism and French freedom in a religious community uh, with both successes and failures. Thanks, Tyler. I really love studying the Alliance Israelite as you know, I'm working more on Haiti than on French Jewish history these mm -hmm. days. That's something uh, that I always love studying. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to group some questions. I have a lot of questions now, and I don't know if I'll get through all of them. But I have two questions for you from colleagues in France. Um, Laurence Cossu Beaumont, um, mm -hmm. John Harris says, Professor Soval, thank you so much for the stimulating thinking. Here is my question How have the reciprocal visits and expatriations? mutually influenced or not, the articulation of race and freedom in our two countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, th this sort of takes me back to my, my work on Paris Noir and looking at um, the presence of African Americans in, in France and what they did both to bring in a, a sort of racial perspective and also to fit into a racial perspective. I mean, I think if you look at Josephine Baker, for example, she became a, a hit in France precisely because she fit into a certain French image of blacks in the 1920s. Um, but it's also fascinating to look at, for example, a more contemporary topic and one that I cannot claim much expertise in, hip hop, which is in terms of just sort of exchanges between communities of color in France and the United States, it's probably one of the most prominent examples, not just today, but in French history, because, you know, in both cases, you've had a massive interchanges between uh, French and American groups, musically and also ultimately ideologically as well. And then finally, I wanted to say a couple things just about, people often look at the sort of impact of uh, African-Americans or Americans of color on France, but I think it's also important to look at the reverse. And the most important example is Franz Fanon, who in many ways inspired the Black Panther Party, inspired Black militant, was a crucial voice in uh, the rise of a certain Black consciousness in the United States in the 1960s, and he was very French. He came from Martinique, he was, uh, spent time in Algeria, he spent, uh, he died in America, but he spent no time living in America. So he was very much a voice of French ideas about race. Uh, and the fact that he was embraced more in the United States than he was in France does not deny the fact that nonetheless, he was a product of France. All right, great. I have another question. Um, from, this is from Jim Cohen. Um, and I'm just going to reframe it a little. I've, I've read, I've read your book. Um, he's wondering if you deal with the paradox that the Cold War strategic rivalry 
facilitated the struggle for civil rights by making it necessary for the U.S. to clean up its image internationally. He says, mm -hmm. although the ex-USSR was not exactly a paradigm of freedom, its existence compelled the U.S. to make at least modest progress towards respect for civil rights. Uh, I will add that as someone who's been studying this period by looking at films on Haiti or projects from this period, I was very interested to see that you were more critical um, of uh, the efforts of the Truman administration. And I loved the discussion of the double V campaign from the Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you could tell everyone a little more about that chapter. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, this is actually the last chapter of the book. And, um, you know, I mean, I think certainly the, the, the American government faced both with the questions of decolonization and with the civil rights movement, tried to marshal uh, the civil rights movement in particular to exemplify what, you know, how, uh, how open American society was to demands of people of color. I think it's important to emphasize a couple points in that. First of all, that this was a, a reaction rather than a planned strategy. This was um, a reaction to overwhelming pressure, not just from the Soviet Union, but from uh, many, many peoples of, of color themselves. I mean, there were the classic stories of, of African diplomats being mistaken for African-Americans and um, being treating, treated accordingly, so much so that it became popular among African-Americans to then dress up as African diplomats and, and fake a British accent in order to get into segregated spaces in the South the 1950s and 1960s. So there was this, you know, mutual interest in sort of the, the global dimensions of this struggle. Um, so I think, you know, uh, certainly the Truman administration and the Eisenhower administration for that matter, did deal with that. But at the same time, they had to deal with the, you know, the, the tremendous, uh, often violent reaction against the civil rights movement. And they had to explain that to, uh, to uh, people who were very skeptical about American goodwill, about the uh, uh, the state of America, the, the American government's goodwill in these issues. So I have another question. The next set of questions comes from former Santa Cruz students. Oh no, <laughs> these are gonna All be All right, the so first I have a question from Professor Robin Mitchell. Hi Tyler, your old student here. It's frustrating to me that it's controversial to express that race embedded into notions of things like Frenchness. Part of belonging is non-belonging. I had thought, I had this thought that it was easier to attack the capital because of its origins. It made it easier to attack in a sense because it is a partially a quote, degrade racialized space, end quote. Do you find that the nations you are studying see their nations as degraded by so-called bad notions of freedom and in need of cleansing and thus making it really free? Hmm. I would say some of the people in those nations do, but it has not been a majority phenomenon. Let's just go back to the Capitol for a moment. One of the things that struck me about that incident was that one of the major accusations of many of the rioters was that their freedom was not being respected because their votes were not being respected because they had voted for Donald Trump and he didn't, wasn't allowed to win. Um, these were people that were idolizing a Republican party that has been engaged in voter suppression for years. Um, and the fact that it has been suppressing the votes of black and brown people in the United States did not bother these people at all. The, it, the problem was that white votes were not counted, and that's why they were uh, calling the whole system illegitimate. So, Robin, I think there's a lot to what you say, but I think there is also, you know, a large segment of the population, both America and France, that really would reject that. Now, one of the things I want to emphasize and is that this is a surprise to some people. I end up uh, end my book on a, a positive note. I feel that things are moving in a good direction. And I do so because if you look at what we've just discussed in terms of ideas of white freedom today, those ideas are in many ways seen as a minority and a fringe. And the, the link to white supremacy is become, has become much more explicit. I mean, it helped that white supremacist groups were literally organizing on the internet for this event. But it is no longer as possible as it was to just sort of blink an eye at these kinds of issues, to blink an eye at the fact that, you know, if you're white, you can go to the Capitol building and do whatever you want, but if you're a member of Black Lives Matter, you're going to be arrested and up. More and more people are aware of that, and I think that's a good thing. Certainly when we're watching the differential treatment that is being meted out to people who participated in this coup, um, that the zip tie person has been released on his own recognizance, 
while you have people who right. uh, marched peacefully in BLM protests um, who got much worse treatment. All right, I have another question from a, a Santa Cruz grad. Professor Sarah Kimball asks, please tell us <laughs> analysis enters into your argument about the racialization of freedom. Um, thanks, and she just says she's a Santa Cruz grad who oh, yeah. from Sarah. courses from you and Joan Scott and is now at DePaul University. So I'm not sure, uh, excuse me, I'm not sure I got the question. Sure, sorry, the question was, can you talk about how gender analysis? Oh, okay. Argument about the racialization of Okay, in many ways they often go together. I mean, one of the, the things I talk about is, for example, voting rights and how those were racialized. But of course they were also incredibly gender. Um, and in many ways in both America and in France, in fact, it's interesting because America and France represent the two countries with, in some ways, the largest gaps between the rights of men to vote and the rights of women to vote. Uh, in, in France, it's basically a century from 1848 to 1946. And in the United States as well, it's really from beginnings of the 19th century, mid, you know, 1830s, 1840s to 1920. So in some ways, this forms a template for the denial of, of freedom based on identity. The other way I want to, to respond to that question, one of my chapters deals with the Statue of Liberty and, or as I call it, white woman on a pedestal. And there are ways in which the whole image of the Statue of Liberty is very much uh, a gendered image of freedom and is very different from earlier ideas. I mean, I make the argument that the, the Statue of Liberty in many ways is uh, modeled on Marianne, uh, based on Delacroix's great statue and other images of Marianne. But Marianne, of course, was a much more dynamic individual. You see uh, Delacroix's painting, she is literally leading an army, carrying a gun. Um, she is very militant, she is in motion. The Statue of Liberty is stuck on a, chap on, a st uh, on a pedestal, unmoving, fully clothed, much more demure, much more passive. So, um, you know, that's, it's an ex another example of how, how gender really does enter into the, the portrayal of liberty, I think, in the modern world. I found that chapter really compelling. And one of the most chilling images for me is when you talked about um, men who are literally lynched um, from something hanging off a replica um, of the Statue of Liberty. So I, I think that's a really wonderful chapter. I hope that everyone afterwards um, will get the book. I'm going to remind Professors Charno and Horn that we had promised people a disc code in the chat so we can distribute that to people. But now I have a question for you from Professor Jennifer Session. Um, and as following up on the response to Jonathan's question, to what extent would you consider the exclusion of Islam in France as a process of racialization as non-white, analogous to intertwined with, related to the racialization of freedom as white? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just pop this in the chat so you can see it. Okay. So that you don't get lost there. I'm going to say, everyone, here's the question. Again, it's um, analogous to intertwined with related to the racialization of freedom is white through the exclusion of black French citizens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, this is a, a wonderful question. And I think there's a lot to recommend this approach. Um, especially the idea that in France, the, the whole relationship of Islam to the state is held up as a uh, a religious community that is attacking the fundamental bases of, 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 of French republicanism, right? That it's the very nature of this community as a community is ultimately unassimilable into the French uh, republican community and therefore has to be held to one side. Now, there's lots of sort of specific issues within that uh, broader question. I mean, for example, there is the fact that many Muslims in France, people who are uh, of Muslim faith, also identify with the Universalist Fra uh, mission of France, for example, do not support the wearing of the, the, the veil in public, so on and so forth, and yet are nonetheless targeted by that state as, as enemies. There's the whole issue of how Francis has tried to develop a quote, French Islam, and what that has meant, and how that has oftentimes blurred the line between sort of, um, you know, discussion of ideology and discussion of identity. Um, let me make one sort of broader point about this that I hope ties into this question. It seems to be one of the issues when you adopt, when a nation adopts uh, 
a belief like freedom as not just an ideological practice, but as a part of its identity, then identities can be shaped in many different ways. If, if, if freedom can be identity, then, then freedom can also be white as part of one's identity as well. So it seems to me that's one of the challenges, and this is something that really brings together France and the United States. The fact that freedom is seen as so much a part of their central core national identity. So if you don't believe in it, you're not French and you're not American. And therefore, that maps onto other ways of how you're not truly French or American. Just the way that French universalism is set up, as you know, is so complicated and has had so many ramifications. Um, I have a question for you from Jeremy Popkin. How would you characterize the state of freedom for people of color in France today? I think it's complicated. Another question you can answer in 30 seconds, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I, think, I think it's very complicated because, of course, first of all, there are many different types of color in France. Uh, there are many, you know, one of my interests is there are many different types of, of uh, black people in France. There's a distinction between people from the Caribbean um, and within that distinction between, uh, on the one hand, people from Martinique and Guadeloupe, and the other hand, immigrants from Haiti. So, um, but what I would say is that one aspect in which there are limits is the ability to people to discuss these kinds of questions in the public sphere. Uh, the extent to which questions of race are silenced in France, that means that uh, the ability of peoples of color to have their own need met, needs met and to express their own ideas is also of course, it's a limit not just on people of color, but all friends. But it does affect people of color in France today. So I would say that um, there is a real focus on individualism, on people as individuals, but in terms of community, there is a real strong rejection of the idea of communities of color. And given that people live in communities, that's a real problem. Yes, I would add there's still the challenge that communotopnisma is deep. Yeah. When you right. have to speak up as a member of the community to talk about the community's exclusion or unequal equality, then you're charged with being anti-Republican because you're, you're speaking as a member of that community already. Um, I have another question from Jim Allen. Um, mm -hmm. Move from the 21st century back to the mid-20th. I would like to hear Dr. Stovall discuss the sense of a different kind of freedom that many Black Americans like Richard Wright, Baldwin and Josephine Baker felt living in France. The, content, the contrast of their experience as you studied Paris Noir can now be contextualized differently in light of your new book on the racial sources of freedom. In countries. Would you mind elaborating on this? And I'm just going to pop this into the chat too if you want to look at it. Okay. Okay, th thank you. Thank you for that question. I mean, one of the uh, Richard Wright's famous statements when he moved to Paris was that there is more freedom in one square block of Paris than there is in the entire United States of America. People pointed out, by the way, that Paris didn't have square blocks, but leave that aside for the moment. Um, so yeah, that was, it's interesting because that was something that was perceived by many black African-American expatriates as a major reason, not so much for coming to France, but for staying in France and something they could really enjoy uh, with their life uh, in France. The idea that they were free from oppression, that they could um, uh, participate fully in the society. Of course, they couldn't vote because they were foreigners, but still, the idea that they would have a, a greater amount of freedom, that they would not be seen as, as, as black and therefore limited in that kind of way. But it's really interesting how that notion of freedom evolves. One of my favorite texts from uh, this, this history is William Gardner Smith's Stone Face where it's a novel written in the early 1960s where he talks about his own life as an expatriate in Paris and how much he loves it. And then he begins to come into contact with Algerians in Paris in the late 1950s, early 1960s, and realizes that their take on freedom in France is extremely different. And ultimately, he realizes that it very much reminds him of the thing that he was trying to escape so that his life as a black man in Paris is more a matter of being part of an elite than having escaped to a society that is truly anti-racist. So in terms of how we look at it now in terms of the idea of white freedom, this poses the question, were they in effect uh, functionally white, these African-American expatriates? That is the question that is in effect posed in the stone face. And in many ways, you know, it was articulated. It, this is something that at the end of his life, 
Richard Wright found himself increasingly pressured by younger African-Americans, especially African-American students coming to Paris in the 1960s, who basically said, you know, you have a great life here, but what are you doing to advance the cause of black people? And are you enjoying this life because you've been made an honorary white man? That kind of that's like Happy Blue, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's the question right. at the yeah. heart there in that film. All right. I have a question. I, I'm now moving back from we went 21st century, 20th. Now I'm taking okay. you the 19th. Ryan Pilcher asks, I'm curious about the relationship between freedom and the notion of civilization, especially mm. in late 19th century France. How does the idea merging out of anthropology at the time that the so-called black race could not be civilized play into the idea of freedom being racialized? Okay, well, yeah, absolutely. This is where you get the term, for example, the civilizing mission as the underlying justification for French uh, imperialism overseas, that this is an effort to, uh, to civilize the races. And it's interesting to note that, of course, the, 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 the history of the, the civilizing mission, the history of simulation as an ideology under, uh, undergoes precisely the evolution that your question is, has mentioned, because ultimately, uh, by, the by the end of the 19th century, the French have largely concluded that you cannot civilize the natives, that they're not, you, it's not possible and therefore, you have to create new structures that will help them live decent lives and also make great profits in France, but, you know, not really expect that they can aspire the levels of, um, you know, of civilization, basically, that the, that, that the French can. Now, of course, people, have, historians have pointed out the, the ironies, of this. I mean, for example, that, you know, the, the, the investment of the French in native education was so poor and so minor that it was very hard to expect people to even learn French, let alone to learn about French civilization. But there is this idea that civilization is increasingly defined in national terms. And this is not just, by the way, a French uh, development. It's this uh, throughout Europe as ideas of nationhood are increasingly racialized in the 19th century, um, bleeding over into the early 20th century. So the idea that you're part of a nation that is civilized is because you're part of a race that is civilized. All right, I have one last question in the queue, and I think that I would have time maybe for one more if anyone wants to okay. put anything left in the chat. This last question I have comes from Sandra Abramson. Um, she asks, how does the analysis of Isabel Wilkerson in her book, um, Cast, if you're familiar with it, relate to the French and transnational exploration, or does it? Okay. Um, I read that book recently. Remember, um, and it's, you know, this is a book that, of course, deals with the United States, but um, certainly it just sort of illustrates the, the many different ways in which at least America, in, at least in America, that ideas of race become, in effect, trump cards, even in situations where they're not supposed to be important, they nonetheless are. And she gives many different uh, specific examples of that. I think you can make the same argument for France. Uh, one of the issues that, again, I'm going to come back to something I started with that really fascinated me was this whole idea of uh, an imperial republic. And the parallel, of course, in the United States is the United States is not just an imperial republic, it's also a slave republic, which France, France never was. But nonetheless, you do have this kind of paradox. And this is a way in which race enters in because it just so happens that all the natives are by, or defined as not. Um, and um, all the French are. Um, and, you know, for example, I'm well aware of the idea, you know, one of the bases of the, this book is the idea is that whiteness is a slippery category and it changes over time. Uh, that's something that, by the way, to come back to, uh, you know, uh, something I mentioned earlier, the Alliance Israelite Universelle, how, you, how do you find Jews as white? And which Jews do you find as, define as white and how does that process work? Uh, and that exists in the United States as well. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think you know, it, it's interesting, of course, that Isabel Wilkerson's book, could be published and become an immediate bestseller in the United States. I'm not sure the same thing would happen to a similar book written about France. All right, I have two final questions, one from me and then one from the floor. Um, since we have time, I will ask this question. Um, again, within French history, you have been pushing against boundaries for and pushing people to think transnationally and in terms of race, and as I said, you helped pioneer the turn towards studying not only Black France, but Black Europe. 
So since your scope is even more macro here, I'm just wondering, do you, Tyler, that being AHA president helped push you to think beyond Europe and turn back to the US and to African-American history? Yeah, I think so. I mean, being AHA president partly it meant that I was just trying to organize a conference, right? And all I could think about was that. But no, it also meant reading proposals from lots of historians from, of, of different areas throughout the world. And, um, Know, taking those into consideration. So actually, let me just put my own here, horn here or say something about my, my future process. One of the projects I've considered working on the future uh, really departs from France. And that is a study of blacks in Israel because it looks at a country that is, has a certain uh, ethnic dimension, but also looks at people that in some ways fit into that definition, in some ways do not, and in some ways are sort of both, right? And so I thought in terms of exploring blackness, that would be a really fascinating subject to study. It's something that's up ground to a complete halt because of COVID right now. But hopefully once we're in normal times, we'll, we'll come back to. So yeah, I mean, I think it has made me think about all these kinds of issues. And one other thing I want to throw in because it's about my own life. Some of you may know this, but I was actually born in a town founded by French uh, uh, settlers in the late 18th century, a town called Gallipolis, City of the Gauls on the banks of the Ohio River. So in some ways, I'm going back to my birthplace. I'll say that I loved that you had a little bit of autobi autobiography in this book. Um, <laughs> so it was nice to see that reference. OK, so I'll, on what you just said, I'll say, Tyler, come talk to me when you're ready to talk about that project. That's something okay. that I um, have thought about a lot. And I have ways <laughs> people can work on that topic remotely. Um, what, one of my loves being um, film and history, mm, and, mm -hmm. um, Jewish film and Israeli film, in addition to Haitian film and French, mm -hmm. there are a growing number of films by Ethiopian and other directors mm -hmm. or by non-Black Israelis who are looking at some of the fissures in society, mm -hmm. um, both between the fact that there are Jews in Israel of African origin, whether North African or Ethiopian, but there are also migrants, people who've mm -hmm. come seeking asylum. Um, right. And there certainly is a lot to say on that, that again, that'll be a very interesting topic. Um, I was asked from the floor whether there, uh, what your next project is. So you mentioned that, is there anything <laughs> that you have um, thinking of maybe on the horizon? Uh, not so much that, but there's a point I wanted to make about my, my work on the, on the Statue of Liberty, because it's not in the book, at least only peripherally, and it's something that I, I wanted to highlight. I talk about the fact that the end that the Statue of Liberty was basically conceptualized as, and over time as, as saluting European immigration, and the fact that you do not have similar monuments in different parts of the country that have also received immigrants, like Angel Island in San Francisco, for example, the U.S.-Mexican border, and certainly not in Charleston, South Carolina. And one of the things I learned from this is that one of the, New York City was actually one of America's greatest slave ports. So I would love to see at some point a monument, not replacing the Statue of Liberty, of course, but something that supplements the Statue of Liberty that speaks that history and the history of the Port of New York as uh, bringing in a very different kind of people. That would be amazing. I can see you collaborating with Professor Leslie Harris and other people mm -hmm. who work trying to get that done. Well, we are at the end of our time. And amazingly, I was able to answer the questions in the queue. So I want to thank Professor Stovall so much um, for really a wonderful talk today. You set the bar very high as in the <laughs> talk in this French press series. Thank you so much. I want to recommend that everyone read this book. It's wonderful. We have put a discount code in the chat that you can use to get it from Princeton University Press. I want to thank um, Professors Horn and Charno for starting this series, and of course also Professor Tip Reagan, um, the Executive Director of the Society for French Historical Studies, who I know is out there. I want to thank all of you for coming, and I just want to let you know that um, uh, SFHS on its own and in conjunction with FCHS and the Western Society for French History is doing a lot of great remote programming. And so this French press series which looks at new books. Um, I said FCHS, I said it fast. And that just came in to me to remind me. Yes, I had said SFHS, FCHS, and the Western. Um, we have an exciting lineup um, of monthly French press book talks coming this spring and summer. The theme this season will be race, gender, colonialism, 
and occupation. The next event will be February the 28th at 1 p.m., um, which I think is East Coast time. It will be um, two books together, Sarah Zimmerman, Militarizing Marriage, West African Soldiers, Conjugal Traditions in, Mo in the Modern French Empire, which um, came out from Ohio University Press um, this last year. And then Sarah Frank's new book, Hostages of Empire, Colonial Prisoners of War, Ishi France, and that will be coming out this summer from Nebraska, and Ruth Guineo will be interviewer for that. So Ed, let me just make sure there's not anything else that I'm missing in the chat. Great. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being flexible with us and uh, being willing to have me ask your questions and for people to be off camera. Um, it's upsetting when events get Zoom bombed, and we definitely did not want that to happen. So thank you all. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for everybody.